Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm so glad that you could make it both here in person and online. Today, we're going to learn presentation skills. Now, when you're thinking about presenting, how many of you have made a presentation before in school or anywhere? Yeah, most of us. Okay, most of us have made some kind of a presentation before. Now, my next question, how many of you hate presenting or you're afraid of presenting? Yeah, okay, about half of you. Now, I want you to think about why. Why are you afraid of presenting or do you hate it? Or do you hate it because you are afraid of it? What do you think? Well, inshallah, by the end of the evening, you will not be so afraid because knowledge is power. And when you know what you're doing, you feel much more comfortable. But really, when it comes right down to it, the only way that you can actually get comfortable speaking is to speak, right? I wanna tell you a story about myself. After I had been a teacher for about 10 years, I was asked to give a presentation in my school to the other teachers. They wanted to learn something about Islam and Ramadan. It was just before the month of Ramadan. And I had never given a presentation before to any of my colleagues. It's different when you're in front of your students. There is a bit of a, you know, kind of a, I am the person with knowledge and you're the person learning. But when you're dealing with people who are on your same level, they're your peers, boy, was I nervous. But after I finished, amazingly, they asked me to do it again the next time and the next time and the next time. And each time I did it, when I stepped out of that little comfort zone, see, this comfort zone is, is what you're comfortable doing. And then we have our real life that pushes you out of your boundaries. And when you can step out of that comfort zone and get pushing yourself, you can actually become quite successful. And if I can do it, so can you. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, I'm going to talk about how you can choose your topic. What are you gonna talk about? And yeah, and how to take a big idea and narrow it down to something that can be used in a presentation. Next, we're gonna talk about creating your speech, how to work on the content and to make it interesting and engaging for the audience. Third, I will be talking about pre delivery techniques. Delivery techniques are things that you are using when you are up here on the stage that make it memorable to the people who are there. And finally, we're going to talk about planning ahead, preparation and practice. So let's begin choosing your topic. Now, what topic are you thinking about that you might like to present? Introducing Islam, okay? What else? Maybe it's something in your work. Now, so let's go with the idea of either presenting about Islam, that's a huge topic, right? Or pre presenting about liking the Arabic language, another huge topic. Okay, so let's go with your goal about Islam, your, your topic of Islam. What is your goal in telling people about Islam? Okay, so either they would convert or they would at least uh, have knowledge about it. So they would maybe get rid of some misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And what about your idea for Arabic? Okay, so you want to get across the point that it's simple and beautiful. 
And if it's for presenting, uh, how to present as a teacher, if that's what you want to present, like perhaps you're going to train teachers, all right? Uh, what would the goal of that be? Would, because that's another big, big, big topic. We have to be able to narrow it down. All right, so now, one of the things that you wanna think about when you are looking at your presentation, you've thought about your topic, you've thought about your goal. Now, what is the message you want people to walk away with? Because that is where your focus really needs to be. You need to remember that people will remember a message. What is it you want them to know? What do you want them to walk away with? Arab Arabic is a beautiful language. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes. Making du'as in English. Good. Now you're you're starting to narrow it down. That Islam teaching them about Islam is really big. Teaching them about du'as in English. Now that is far more presentable, right? Unless you're going to be doing a whole year's worth of seminars, <laughs> right? That's, we have to narrow down our topics. Okay, now, when you are choosing and narrowing down your topics, you want to consider a few things. What are your areas of expertise? What do you already know? Your education, your experience, what have uh, people, what have you been researching about? Okay, these are your areas of expertise. That's something to consider. Another thing to consider, what is unique about your perspective? What is it that you see differently than others? Okay, uh, many people may come up and ask you about something, right? And that's the next one. Oh, sorry, not the next one, it's the one after that. But who exactly will your audience be? Are you talking to people who are knowledgeable in the topic that you're talking about? Or are you talking to people, your audience will be people who don't really know very much about that topic. That's important because if you are dealing with just plain beginners, you have to start in a completely different place than you do when you are talking to people who have some general knowledge already, okay? Next, what is your time limit? It could be a quick presentation a speech, five to seven minutes, maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's a long workshop like this one, which is an hour and a half long. How much time you have will determine your content, okay? Because, for example, this presentation, if I wanted to do it well, it would be in three separate meetings, three separate workshops of an hour and a half each, All right? If I wanted to cover everything very well for you. But because I don't have that, I have one session. So I had to narrow down my ideas and decide what am I going to keep? What am I going to remove? Next. What are your strengths and weaknesses? For example, uh, if, it's, if you're talking about presenting, maybe you are a person who is very friendly, but you don't make a lot of facial expressions, okay? So being very friendly is a strength. Not making a lot of facial expressions would be a weakness. So it's great, actually, if you are a distance from people that don't need to see the facial expressions so much. But if you are online, for example, right, you want to really work on those facial expressions because that's mostly what they see. All right, next. How can you narrow that subject down? Okay, basically, you want to go through the process of brainstorming. How many of you have heard of brainstorming before? Okay, who can tell me, how do you brainstorm? Whatever you think about something, right? Okay, 
that's good. When you brainstorm, the important thing is don't start to judge your ideas. The idea is when you do the first brainstorming, just write down anything, anything that comes to your mind, whether you think it's good or whether you think it's bad, just whatever comes to your mind. Then when you can't think of anything else, then you want to go back and look at your list. Did it make you think of something else? Great, if it did, write it down. If not, now you can start evaluating. How good is that? Is it going to work? Can I do it in that amount of time, right? Thinking about it, sometimes you think, oh no, I, I, I can't do that. You know, as you start writing your ideas, I can't do that, it won't work. Don't, don't allow those thoughts to involve, be involved in that first part of your brainstorming process because sometimes you come up with totally different ideas that you really wouldn't have thought of before, okay? And sometimes it leads somewhere, maybe not exactly as it is, but it might lead you to a much better idea, okay? Now, another way to go ahead and narrow it down is to think about these three zones. You want to look at the topics you know because you need to know information about it. Then what about topics you care about? And finally, what do you think your audience will care about? And you wanna find that sweet spot right here that's going to involve all three of those, something that you know, something that you care about, and something that your audience would be interested in. This combination is going to help you narrow it down, okay? So you can, when you are presenting, you wanna keep in mind that you're presenting for a purpose. The purpose has to do with your audience and who you are presenting two okay going back to that idea what is the message you want them to walk away with and find that message here it's going to involve all three of these okay now after we've gone through this let's go back now all right you were thinking about islam huge 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 topic and you said your goal was to have people understand Islam better, maybe to convert, okay? And the message you wanted them to remember was Islam is a complete religion. That's still really big. Now that you've thought about all of that, let's say that you have a 20 minute presentation, maybe 10 or 15. How can you take that gigantic topic and narrow it down? You need it to be more precise. Yes, you, you would have to limit how much you elaborate, okay? So you want to look at the areas, what do you know? What areas do you know really well about the religion? Narrations, ah, see, now we're getting somewhere, okay? So narrations, Narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, okay. And then there are, there are huge books of narrations. <laughs> All right. And those are highly complex. So maybe you want to focus on and allow you to narrow it down. What subject interests you and you care about a lot? Okay, maybe it would be how the prophet and the companions dealt with people who were not Muslim, right? Just saying, right? And then you would limit it just to those and you would focus on those, right? Do you see how that narrows it down? Good, any other questions? And Lemma, your, yours is also really, really big. So maybe you want to start about one aspect of the, of the language, right? That the sound. the sound of the language, okay? Mm-hmm, exactly. 
Or maybe you want to look at history of the language, or even that is big, right? Again, maybe you want to look at the differences in the sounds between the common English and Arabic. Now we're getting closer to something that is workable. Do you see? It's getting more and more specific. We're ready to create the speech. So we're going with Catherine's idea of looking at the hadith or the narrations of the prophet uh, that have to do with dealing with people of other religions. Okay, even that, by the way, is a huge topic. Let's see what we can do. We need to organize it. What is the basic organization of a speech? Who knows? What would you have? Okay, a title, yes. You could do an outline, right? A strong opening. The definition of a title, introduction. Thank you. This is what I was looking for. An introduction, a body, a conclusion. Think simple, right? My mother always told me, stay simple and sweet. Introduction, body, conclusion. That's basic. It's basic in your writing. It's basic in a presentation. Now, where are we going to go? We want to, just like DTM Kajitan said, we want to grab their attention right away. What did I do at the very beginning to grab your attention? I asked you a question, okay? So I asked you a question right from the beginning and quotes are a great one. You can also use a fact, particularly if it's a shocking fact or unknown, right? People don't know, yes. It's definitely sensationalized. You can use humor or a very short story. I also included a short story of myself. All right, then we wanna look at the rule of three. An anecdote, yes, an anecdote is here. It is a short story, very short, usually about one to two minutes, okay? Now, when we're looking at the rule of three, we're talking about making things more enjoyable, interesting, and memorable. Right there, you have three. Did you see it? Putting things into trios helps people to remember them better. You can use it in your words. You can use it in your organization. Maybe you have three subtopics that you want to discuss, okay? And the next one is using stories. Stories are so powerful because they connect to people's emotions. And when you tell a story, it creates an empathy between you and your audience, whether those are your students or whether they are your colleagues, it doesn't matter because you want to focus on something that they will understand they have gone through an emotion that you've experienced. Okay, next, you want to vary your methods. Why do you think you want to vary your methods? Change them up. So they don't become boring. Yeah, you don't wanna be boring. Exactly. So you can keep your audience with you, right? They'll be engaged instead of picking up their mobiles and talking to the person next to them. Right, keeping students engaged in the lesson is very difficult. Clarity, you want to have clarity in what you're saying. Notice even my slides are simple, right? We don't need all these big words. I know lots of people that feel that they have to use fancy words if they want to make an impression. But honestly, the average person doesn't speak like that. They don't speak in all those fancy words. The most important thing is that your message gets across. So you want to keep it simple and sweet. All right, finally, finish with power. This is where you want to really push that message that you would like your audience to remember. Because the science has shown that they might remember a few things within the body of your presentation, but the thing they remember the most is the ending. 
even when I was taking a class by the world champion of public speaking 2020, what, 2015, uh, DTM, Mohammed Al-Qatani. He told me he spent only a few days, maybe a week, writing his winning speech. And then he spent two weeks on the last sentence because he wanted it to have power. And he wanted it to give that message, that powerful message that he really wanted them to walk away with. So you want to, don't just say, and thank you very much. No, no, no. And that's it. No, you want to leave with power. Okay, moving on. How do you tell a story? Right? We all tell stories. We tell stories to our children. We hear stories from the elder people in our family. Everybody tells stories. Oh my gosh, did you let me tell you about the traffic today? When you are looking at telling a story, and I'm going to make you tell a story soon, so keep it in mind. All right, you're going to start here where you give a little bit of an idea of what's happening. And then you have rising action. You can use your rule of three here and have three actions that are leading up to a climax in your story. Generally, you have some kind of a problem that you're going to hit here, right? A character in a story. Oh, I was having a great day at work when bam, you know, something happened, right? And then all of these things started happening after it until the climax is, but finally you resolved it and the action starts falling, okay? Big things are happening here and you have finally resolved the problem, okay? Good? Yeah. yeah. All right, now I want you to share your story and apply what you learned. What we're going to do is something called an impromptu where you have just one to two minutes and you can use a story that you have to connect. Basically, I want you to tell a two minute story. One to two minutes, okay? One to two minutes, you're like, two minutes. <laughs> I saw that face. <laughs> One to two minutes where you came across a problem or you were struggling with something, whether you're struggling with something at work or at school, and then you resolved it. You got it figured out and you got past that problem. Okay. Can you think of one? Now, let's move on to delivery techniques. Okay, how can you deliver a presentation to make it memorable? First of all, the question you wanna ask is, am I communicating my message? This is the most important thing for you to do, is to communicate the message that you have chosen for your audience. And sometimes it's not so clear. Are they getting it? I mean, you see their faces, or maybe you can't, and it's like, they're getting it, they're not getting it, I'm not sure. So experts agree that 70 to 93% of communication is non-verbal, not related to words. It has everything to do with non-verbal communication. What the heck? is nonverbal communication. First of all, we've got body language. When you are giving a presentation, one of the things that you want to consider is, here's your space, right? How are you using it? If you stay only in one spot the entire time, especially I've got two rows here of tables, I don't wanna spend all my time over there I wanna have some time over here so I can see the audience better, right? And they can see me better. Because when we are in eye contact, we actually understand better. Then you want to be able to use it well, okay? 
uh, I mean, I don't have to do everything, right? I can come all the way over here. I can use here, but I want to stay within the area where I can be seen both here in person and on the camera. Right now I'm heading over and out of camera range. See, and Kajitan wants to fix it, but I'm just gonna have to move over. You have to know when you've got an online box, right? It's, it's far more limiting. Also your hand gestures. When you are talking to people in general, it's good to have hands that are open, okay? This communicates to people that you are open to them. If you are like this the whole time, or your hands are like this, or your hands are like this, okay, it's communicating something else. If I'm sitting here like this, what does this communicate to you? Yes, I might seem angry, right? I might seem angry or closed off, okay? Um, and if I'm like this, if I'm walking too fast, okay, hey, you gotta watch out for that. People get nervous. When they get nervous, they pace. I've seen students do all kinds of things. They, they go like this too, right? Or, or the women with the hijab or the men with their retra, it's, you know, this kind of thing, right? So you wanna watch what your hands and your feet are doing. Oh yes, the nose, the glasses. My glasses are always a problem. Also, when you want to point, if you point like this, what does that feel like? as on the, on the receiving end, if I'm like this, you're like, wow, what did I do? But if I do this, you see, now it's not threatening. Just something so simple, right? Putting your fingers in and having your thumb be the pointer. Now it's no longer threatening, but they're still making it clear. Another thing that you could do with your hand gestures to make it clear, um that uh if let's say if you have three points you could do one two three or even one two three all right things like this will emphasize what you're doing and these physical hand gestures will help all right facial expressions your facial expressions are important you want to smile. If you have no expression on your face, if you are just like this the entire time, are you going to be able to connect to your audience? No. They're gonna be like, oh my gosh, is it a real person or is it a robot? Okay? Artificial intelligence, who knows? <laughs> okay, so you want to be able to have your facial expressions matching your content. What is it you're talking about? If you are talking about a struggle that you went through, maybe your face would look like this, something that you're very concerned about. And if you're talking about something joyful, you'll want to smile because you're communicating that message through your smile, even if your words don't comprehend. They don't reach the person. Your smile will. So our facial expressions are very powerful. Our stance. That means how are we standing? Now, some people do this. Okay. And they're on one hip. Okay. Or they're like one leg standing like this. This does not give confidence. It doesn't give off that feeling of confidence. So you'll want to be, put your feet at shoulder length, okay? And then you want to slightly be on your toes, only a little bit forward. This allows you to move easily, okay? Have you ever, just stand up one minute. Stand up, okay? Put your feet at shoulder width, okay? Now, feel like the weight is on the back of your heels. How easy is it to move? Now, switch it. 
move it forward shift your weight forward onto your toes can you move easily now all of a sudden you can move yeah it makes a big difference the other thing in your stance that you want to work on is your shoulders back you don't want your shoulders forward so as you are in your stance with your on your toes so you can kind of feel that then your shoulders are back and your chin is up okay not down right -da -da. now that's a powerful stance and you will come across much more confident and you will feel more confident thank you very much have a seat got you a nice stretch didn't it <laughs> all right the last thing I want to talk about are some online limitations. When we are looking at presenting online, we if you are not like this, you're not in a hybrid meeting and you have a camera and you're presenting, that camera, usually if you are in using your uh, laptop camera, it's quite limited, right? Kajitan has this great wide angle lens that he is using. And it's allow, allowing me to go forward and back and not be too far away from the camera so they can still see my expressions. But when you are dealing with something on Zoom, then suddenly you are limited in the amount of space you have. If you are seated, then you're gonna wanna make a point of doing a lot of facial expressions you'll want to make a point to bring your hands up into the view of the camera, right? Because usually it's only catching here. And if you're making gestures like this, they probably can't see it on the camera, okay? On your laptop camera. So you want to make sure that your gestures come up higher. All right, good. Now, the most important thing is that you communicate, right? So if I have to make a funny face and tell you that things are crazy, okay, and make myself silly, no problem. You got the point, didn't you? All right, now, moving on to the voice. This is the second thing of nonverbal communication, and it is so powerful. There are four P's that I want to tell you about. The first one, yeah, P, they start with the letter P, okay? So what do you think it might be from this picture? You won't know. This is pitch, pitch, yes. That talks about the tone of your voice, okay? Then how fast? which is the pace, okay? Instead of pacing like this, now we're talking about the rate that you are speaking or the speed at which you are speaking. So pitch, pace, then, what is that? Yeah, say it, I heard you, pause. Yeah, pauses. You need to pause when you're speaking, right? People need time to digest the information. And what do you think this is? Volume. Another way to say it is power. Okay, so we're going to go over these four. So when you vary your pitch, you are looking at a high or a low tone. Okay, your tone of voice. And we have three voices. Have you ever heard somebody who speaks up here in their nose? Okay. This person is using their head voice. And have you ever heard somebody who's very wispy? They, it's just like here, they're not getting much breath, okay? They are using the middle voice. But what we really want to do is use the chest, okay? And use the power that we have in the diaphragm, okay? Because our diaphragm and our breathing are the ones that are going to help us to get a powerful voice. But the interesting thing is, especially in storytelling, you can use all three and make it very interesting, 
right? For example, maybe you have a neighbor who is always bothering you. And this neighbor has a nasal voice. And my neighbor told me this and that and this and that. And then maybe you have a little old lady. She's talking about, oh, honey, don't worry about it. Maybe it's your grandmother. Just don't you bother about the neighbors. And then you have your father. And your father's got a very deep voice. So now you can use all three. And it catches the audience's attention. It helps them to distinguish who is speaking. And it gives you more power. So you want to vary that pitch. Use those three voices. Also, when you are asking a question, have you seen my wallet? Did you hear my voice go up at the end of the question? In English, we do this. Have you seen my wallet? Okay. Keep that in mind. If I say, have you seen my wallet? Do you see how different that is? What did I communicate? I said the same words, exactly the same words, but my tone, my pitch changed. I went from asking a question to accusing you of something. Mm -hmm. Do you see the difference? So you have to be careful <laughs> when you are doing that. Be careful and know when to use that properly, especially if you're, if you're talking to your little kids. Ah, have you washed your hands? As you're looking at their hands all dirty, right? <laughs> you know they haven't washed their hands. And they'll say, um, yes, yes, I washed my hands. <laughs> okay, another thing. When you are changing your pitch, it adds emotion. And how do we connect to people? We connect through emotion. So think about how your voice changes with emotion. I just gave you an example here, right? My voice went up here and here it actually went down and it was lower, right? Maybe if you're upset, what does your voice do when you're upset? What is your voice? It cracks. Maybe it cracks. Yeah. Maybe your voice cracks. Or yeah, it might. What about if you're really, really happy or excited? What does your voice do? Squeaks. Maybe it squeaks. <laughs> it might go really high. Okay. So it depends on what you're talking about, right? And it depends on the emotion that you want to communicate. But you do want to avoid extremes. You don't want to go up here and talk like this because everybody's going to go, Ugh. right? And you don't want to be down here way too low because that's about as low as I can go. And it sounds weird, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So you want to avoid the extremes. Good. Now let's move on. We've talked about pitch. Now we're gonna talk about pace. Remember this is our speed zone. It's how slow or how fast you are speaking, okay? You want to avoid extremes. Have you ever sat in a presentation where the person was talking at a mile a minute was like, okay, we're gonna go over here. And you're like, what did he say? Did you hear what he said? I didn't hear what he said, right? It's so fast. And sometimes when we get very nervous, we start speeding up. And the opposite of that, I call that Speedy Gonzales, by the way. I don't know how many of you are old enough to know about the cartoon, the little mouse, Speedy Gonzales. Andale, andale. Anyway, so he goes super fast. And the next one is super slow. And I've had people do that too. They are trying to remember the words, <laughs> okay? And they go so slow, you're like, oh, OK, 
okay, speak, speak, you know? I mean, even you feel like you want to lean in and help them for crying out loud, right? So you want to avoid those two extremes, but you can use them, right? You can use them in different places, but not too much, right? Just little bits, give people a taste of, oh, I was so excited, Daddy. Did you see what I got after school? <gasps> okay, fast. All right, and then I'm really upset, Dad. Nobody likes me. Now I slowed it down. Okay, but it wasn't severe, right? You want to avoid the severity, but you want to use it to make an impact. All right, the other thing you want to do is avoid getting stuck in a rhythm. Have you ever heard like the drum? They will beat, maybe you will speak in a rhythm. Da, 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 da. I went down to the store and then I went to the house and then I went to the, the, right? If you keep repeating that rhythm, some people do it, right? They get into a rhythm and they just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and people start falling asleep, right? <laughs> because even though you've got a variety in your tone, it's still too repetitious. All right. You want to listen to those beats. Where are you putting the stress on your words? Okay. All right. And word groups. When you are breaking up sentences into word groups, it helps you. For example, I want to go home, okay? Instead of, I wanna go home. Do you see the difference? It helps to communicate it better. And as we can see later, we can play around with that and change our meanings too. Open your book to page 35. Notice there's a very slight pause in the middle there. If I use the word groups, it makes it easier to read makes it easier to remember. Now, going into pauses in some more detail. These are taking short stops while speaking. You can do it between the word groups, just like I was telling you, and they will add meaning. For example, I want to go home. Not you, I want to go home open your book to page 35, not your laptop, not your phone, <laughs> right? So now just by adding a pause and stressing some of the syllables or some of the words, it is now changing the meaning of what I am saying. You also want to say it before an important, give a pause before an important message. This gives your audience a heads up. What I'm gonna say now is important. I just want to say this. It's really important to me. Notice the pause. Unless, if I didn't pause, if I just said, I wanna say this, it's important to me. Now you've lost the impact. Do you hear it? I just want to say it's important to me. Okay? That pause signaled your listeners to key in. This is something important. The other thing that you want to do with pauses, if you have a punchline, a funny joke, all right? I don't know that many jokes, but let me tell you one that I know. There was a mushroom. And he walked into the restaurant and he said, the waiter came up to him, he said, can I have a Coke please? And the waiter looked at him and he said, we don't serve mushroom in here. He says, why not? I'm a fun guy. Okay, uh, I know. <laughs> okay, so fun guy and fun guy, which means mushroom. Okay, so, so it's a play on words. Okay, why not? 
pause. I'm a fun guy, right? It helps you to make that punchline or your joke more interesting. And you can emphasize a word by pausing before it. All right, now moving on to power. It's pretty simple. You do not want to have your voice shouting like you're yelling at somebody across the field. How are you doing over there? If you're like this all the time in an area this small or online, oh my God, you're gonna give them a headache and you're gonna lose your voice, okay? But sometimes it can be used for impact, right? And I was coming around the curve in my car when bam, see? <laughs> You jumped. I used that very loud voice, but very briefly, and I immediately caught your attention. And you're awake now. <laughs> okay. Then you have loud, which is what I'm using here. I'm talking to a large group. Okay. And regular voice, which I might talk if somebody was standing here next to me, right? Make it maybe a little bit more difficult for you to hear me in the back. And then you have a quiet voice. Now I have Lemma's here next to me and we're talking about, uh, Lemma, I can't do this. It's, it's, I don't know, I'm having problems with this Arabic letter, it kills me, okay? Or very quiet. Actually, they call this a stage whisper. And sometimes if you want to really touch somebody, about an emotion, like when my mother passed away, then you can use a voice like this. And it's powerful, even though it's quiet, right? All of these things are giving you a vocal variety. Now, we're gonna practice, yay! <laughs> okay, who wants to try pitch? Okay, pitch. We're, we're going to do the three voices, cup in your nose, in your throat, and in your chest. Okay, and you're just going to say, I am a great person. I'm a great person. I'm a great person. Pace. We're going to do fast and slow. I can play with language. I can play with language. When you do it slow to get more effect, you want to draw it out. Like you're, you're, you take your vowels here. I can play with language. <laughs> it makes them smile, makes them laugh, and still, it rem you remember it. Next, pauses. I can use the strength of my voice, or I can use the strength of my voice. How will you pause it? Where will you put your pauses? As you can see, we've got lots of different things. Now, power. I change my voice to make an impact. I change my voice to make an impact. All right, use that power range, right? From big to little or little to big. Um, we've gone through our nonverbal communication and now I wanna talk about how we use slides like in this presentation, okay? You can see here the use of sides on the computer screen there. It gets all of the edges. And alhamdulillah, this screen is big enough that it doesn't cut off any of my screen. Okay, but sometimes it does. So I want you to remember this acronym. When you are talking about slides, I want you to remember mail. Like, I'm gonna send you a letter through the mail. 
M stands for measured. Because if you are using a screen in person, how big is the screen? If it's a gigantic screen like this, and it would actually cover the whole thing, then I would have to make sure I have high definition pictures. Okay, but this is a normal size, right? And if I am using the laptop, then I want to make sure that I have a, some area that I can put the picture of the speaker, right? Without covering up everything. The second one is animated. All right, so you want to use animation when you are using a PowerPoint. You don't want people reading the, the script ahead of you, right? You want them focused on what you are talking about at that time, and animation is what allows you to do it. It helps them to stay focused. Interesting, how do we keep our slides interesting? Well, we can put funny pictures like this, or we can use color and charts, anything that is going to catch the eye. The L, what do you think L is for? It's language, okay? Basically, when you are looking at your PowerPoint, you want to follow the rule of six by six. Some people do it seven by seven. What does that mean? Basically, no more than six words in a line and no more than six lines down in a page, okay? And you'll notice I don't have full paragraphs anywhere because what will happen is they will just read the paragraph and they won't listen to me. Another way is to just keep it simple. Again, simple and sweet, all right? You don't need, you should not actually clutter everything up. If it's too busy on your screen, you're gonna, the audience is gonna have trouble keeping focused, okay? So now planning ahead. Preparation and practice. What do you need to know before you go to speak? You need to prepare really well. Make your to-do list and you're going to practice. What do you need to know? You need to know how long is your speech going to be? Basically, if you have a five to seven minute speech, it's going to be about 700 words. If you have a speech that involves humor or things that are, have punchlines that people might laugh, reduce that by about 100 words. So you're going to be about 600 words. Then will you have a question and answer session in your presentation? Will it be during the presentation? At the end of the presentation? Where is it going to be? You need to plan for it. How long do you have for that question and answer? Do you have five minutes, 10 minutes? What is it? Next, what is the available technology? As you can see, I've got my laptop and I've got Kajitan's laptop and he's got a screen and we've got two cameras. We've got this screen. There are many things that you can use. And, but if you want it to just be simple, you can just have a computer, right? with a laptop computer that's already on there. And you don't always need a screen. Sometimes you can just have a whiteboard, right? Do you need a microphone? For me, because I'm standing here and not next to the laptop, I do need a microphone, okay? If it's a really big hall and people are far away, I need a microphone and I'm gonna need speakers that are gonna project my voice to the audience. And what is the space that you can use? The best thing is to know the place that you're going. Go a day ahead. If you can't, go an hour ahead. Walk around the space that you've got. Understand how many steps can I take before I reach to the end? How many steps can I take to go from here? Um, where is my face in this horrible light here from the projector that's killing my eyes, right? 
that's the spot I want to avoid. Okay, you want to practice with those spaces. And what helpers do you have available to you? I have DTM Kajitan and Saleh was here uh, earlier helping me set up. Okay, so do you have a tech person that's going to help you set up? Do you have, if it's a large place, maybe they would have an external microphone and that you would need the, a person to take it to people to ask questions, right? We, it's hard to do all of these things at once. If you want to be able to focus on your presentation, it's better to have help. Next is practice. There are many things that you can do to practice. And over the years, basically, these are the ones that I've come up with that I feel are the most important. You should know what you're going to say instead of memorizing it. When you memorize, you memorize word by word. And if you forget one word, that's it, you're lost. But if you know what you want to say and you know it, how, how do you think you can learn it and know it? I know I want to talk about this part and then I want to talk about that part. And then I'm going to tell a story about this. Tell stories about your own life right? And you know your stories. You don't have to memorize those words. And you will almost never say the exact same thing each time you say it, right? It changes just like we do. If we're telling, uh, you know, you tell your friend and, and then she says, oh, oh, Sarah heard about it. I want you to tell your story again. So you have to tell it again. Do you tell it exactly word for word? Did you memorize it? No but you know the story, right? This is very important. I highly recommend in a short speech that you memorize your short beginning and you memorize your power message at the end, okay? And other than that, just know what you want to say. All right, if you chunk it, it makes it easy to that power of three. I've got three points I want to talk about, right? Okay, so I know that I want to talk about, uh, in my story, I wanted to talk about, I was working in a school and I was, then I was asked to prepare a presentation for the first time and I did the presentation and it was successful, okay? That's all I need to know. Did I memorize all of the words that I said during that story? No, but I, I narrowed it down to a kind of an outline. As I said, the opening and the closing. Now, when you are practicing, the amazing thing is our subconscious mind is an extremely powerful thing. When it remembers things, it stores memories as pictures, okay? So it's going to store this memory here. I'm looking out at you. If you are practicing only like this in your home, let's say you're practicing in your bedroom or something, right? And you're practicing your speech. And then suddenly you are in a totally different location and you have to go like this your subconscious is going to forget and you will not remember well. But if you practice in multiple locations, even if it's something as simple as turning from here to here to here to here and saying it in those different locations, it teaches our subconscious mind to focus on what you're saying instead of what you're seeing. Okay, that way, when you get up on the stage or in front of the other people, you will be in a new location, but your subconscious says, oh yeah, I know I have to say this speech and won't be shocked about the new location. This will help you so much. Feedback. How do you think we can get feedback on our speeches? What can we do to get some feedback? 
ask questions, okay? You can ask questions. You have somebody watching with you, right? Group discussion. A, good, a group discussion. Yes, you could. You could do a group discussion. Okay, you can have a quiz. You can give a feedback form. You can, you can uh, do a poll, right? If you're going to do this uh, with a friend on Zoom, let's say you can't meet up, right? And you want to practice. So go ahead. You can have a form that you want, or you can just ask. Keep it simple and sweet, right? Ask your friends, ask your family, ask your colleagues. If you're going to be delivering in front of your colleagues, ask one of your colleagues that you are very comfortable with and say, could you please watch this for me and give me any suggestions, okay? Because when we do that, we can get an outside perspective that we couldn't get on our own. Now, another way to do it is to film yourself. You can use Zoom. You can use your camera. You can use your laptop uh, camera, your phone camera, and just videotape yourself. Nobody has to even know, right? Nobody else has to see it, only you. Because sometimes we do those silly things, right? You know, with these repetitive movements, <laughs> and we don't notice it until we watch ourselves. And when we watch ourselves, it can be very powerful. Okay, I recommend watching twice. The first time, only focus on the content, what you are saying. And then the second time, focus on the nonverbals, your voice and your body language. In summary, we talked about choosing your topic and how to narrow it down. And we talked about creating your speech, making it have impact and engage. And we talked about the delivery techniques so that you could communicate and make it memorable. Then finally, we talked about planning ahead with preparation and practice. Questions? And I'm sure the Toastmasters on the Zoom are, are counting my ahs and ums. <laughs> because in Toastmasters, that's one of the things that we do. Yeah, we, we actually have somebody who counts your filler words. And that helps you to actually get rid of them. When I first started off in Toastmasters eight and a half years ago, they called me the queen of ahs and ums. Um, um, um. <laughs> well, uh, every time it was, uh, 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 um, it really takes away from the message, doesn't it? So this is one of the things that we learn about in Toastmasters, being aware of it. And if you have a situation like that, it's about training yourself to pause. It's that another power of pause. Pause instead of saying ah. Uh, Thank you, Madam Sandy. Hi. For it was uh, really amazing and eye-opening. Though I'm still practicing more of this. Uh, a few questions like that. If the session is say one hour or two hour lectures, mm -hmm. do you think we can able to manage same enthusiasm and the pattern you are just sharing with us? Yes, I do it. <laughs> It, you know, I do that in four classes a day, but I don't do it every okay. day. I do it three days a week. <laughs> and, yeah, okay, yeah. and the key is that you don't need to be the speaker all the time. You want to get your audience involved, right? If you are a teacher, you want to get your students involved. Have them do the talking. Have them try it out. Have them have a discussion, right? And then you can be a guide and observer and you don't have to maintain that all the time. Um, I just want to ask you very quickly. I'm, I tend to be very shy when presenting. Do you have any strategies or any techniques to reduce or to overcome shyness before you present? Yeah, you know, everybody is nervous hmm. when, when they are going to present, even the professionals. It's mm -hmm. about 
learning to use that energy instead of letting that energy control you, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, preparation and practice are one of your biggest helpers. If you know your information and you are preparing and you have people, you practice in front of smaller audiences, maybe just one person, and then you make it two people, three people. I've had students that have actual uh, disabilities with speaking and, mm -hmm. and phobias. And so I would start off the semester having that student come into my office and they would present just to me. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then they would invite a friend at their next time. And then they would invite two friends. And then we would do it in a classroom with those two or maybe three friends. Right. And okay. just gradually build yourself up to it. It's about going back to my very one of my first slides about stepping out of your comfort zone. It takes time and practice, but you can do it. Thank you, Sandy, for uh, for this amazing workshop. You're very uh, I really like this. Uh, I do have a question about role playing. When okay. did you learn to role play? As uh, I can see, you put different hats all at the same time, and you you look professional. So, how did you get this uh, this this skill? Let's say practicing with your voice. Honestly, you can you can watch shows. You can. I like to watch cartoons. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a cartoon geek. I I will admit it. I love cartoons, and they're great for imitating. Right? And you want to imitate uh, Mickey Mouse. Hi, I'm Mickey Mouse. Okay. And, you know, all of these different voices, it's about practicing and thinking about if you've got a story that you're telling with different characters, what is that knowing that character, right? What does that character look like? Uh, do they, is it an old person when they're stooped over? Okay when they're walking and their voice is a little like this. Okay. Um, or is it a, a little kid who's, you know, like this and they're so excited and they're looking up because they're short, right? So they would be looking up at the adults. Okay. It's about putting yourself into the shoes of that character you are portraying. And it's about practice. <laughs> Oh my God, adding lib is big time. Yes, you need to practice. That's one of the things that we do in Toastmasters that has helped me enormously. We work on table topics, which is impromptu speaking. And when you are doing impromptu speaking, you learn to think quickly while you're on your feet. Imagine you are, for example, in a, in a meeting. I used to sit in meetings and the meeting would finish and I'd be going home and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I should have said this. I should have said that. Why didn't I say that? I knew that, right? right? And I would forget it all the time. And when I got into Toastmasters, I forced myself to do table topics over and over and over and over and over again so that it would teach my brain to think more quickly, to respond to things. And it's something that just takes time and practice. I have one more thing before we go, a message that I would like to tell you. Why should we even speak at all? Why should we give presentations? Why do you think we should? It can change things for the good. Inshallah. Yes? To spread a message to share information, to give, to help other people, okay? All right, now, it's also to make an impact because if you make an impact in your presentation, they will remember the information. This lady is someone who has made a huge impact in many people's lives. Does anybody know her name? Oh. No, not Oprah. No. no, but she was a friend of Oprah. Her name is Maya Angelou. 
And she had this lovely quote. She said, I have learned that people will forget what you said and they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And this is the message I want you to walk home with. Thank you very much. Thank you.